Hey everyone, uh, today we've got Matt talking about IPv6 and containers. I've known Matt for a long time, he's an awesome guy. Uh, listen to everything he has to say and please laugh at his jokes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's really a privilege and an honour to be able to uh, be here today and speak to you about IPv6 and containers, a horror story. Now, a lot of the talks at LCA are very aspirational. They're very, uh, you know, fluffy and warm, and, and I did this, and it was fantastic. This is not one of those talks. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is one of those talks where, where a, a plucky yet slightly unlikable protagonist um, barely manages to escape with his life from the burning building and the psychopath. <laughs> um, so just a quick note before we get started. Uh, for questions, I don't take questions at the end of the talk. Um, I'd prefer you to be enlightened immediately rather than spend the rest of the talk wondering what the hell I'm on about. So stick your hand up, I'll repeat the question, answer it, we'll move on. So no questions at the end. So what am I going to be talking about? The overview of, of today's talk is basically I want to start by just making sure that everyone's on the same page with the basics of IPv6. There's a lot to it. The bits that, that I need to talk about today are relatively straightforward, so I'll spend a bit of time just making sure that everybody has the same understanding of IPv6, because if you don't understand what IPv6 is and what it does at all, then the rest of this is kind of confusing. Uh, and then also going to be covering why IPv6 and containers are a great match, because they really are. Then I'll tell you why you probably can't use them. <laughs> and maybe if you're really lucky, a couple of hacks you might be able to do to get around if you're really, really, really keen on doing this. So IPv6, what is it and what does it do? Well, it is the next generation of the internet protocol. Standardised a long, long time ago, finally people are starting to pick it up because we have realised that we are completely screwed on the IPv4 front. Uh, it fixes a number of problems that were present in IPv4, because IPv4 is quite an old protocol. It's been around for a long time. It was designed and developed and deployed in a time before we understood a lot of the things that people were going to use the internet for. So. IPv6 came along and they went, well, here are some things that were broken out about IPv4, so we'll add some new ones in. And then a few of those no new ones went and broke other things. On the whole, though, IPv6, I think, is a better protocol. And the main reason, and the, most, the one that's most important for this talk, is that it has lots and 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 lots of addresses. Heaps of addresses. Lots. How many lots is in there? I didn't actually count. Eight. There's eight lots of, of addresses. In fact, there's a lot more than that, as it turns out. I like to do a space size comparisons because it's important to understand exactly how much more address space we have in IPv6. Because there's so many things that we do in IPv4, we do them because, um, because that's just how things are done, because we have to do them that way. And when we switch to IPv6, it's very easy to keep doing things in the same old IPv4 way because that's just how things are done here. Um, so understanding that we have a huge amount of address space in IPv6 does help. So the, for unique addresses, okay, 2 to the 32 in IPv4, about 4 billion. IPv6, 2 to the power of 128. It's just a very, very long number. Um, and the funny thing is, humans are actually really bad at understanding exponential growth. So your brain is probably thinking 128, 32, 128 is four times bigger than 32, so it's four times as many addresses. That's not very much. No, hang on, that can't be right. 128, oh, 128 minus 32. It must be 96 times as big. Well, that's, a, that's a fair amount bigger. No, it's no, but it's not, though, because every time you, have an, an, you add 1 to that exponent, you're doubling the size of it. So 2 to the 32 is 4 billion. Then you have 8 billion, 16 billion, 32 billion, you know, so on and so forth. You get, very quickly, you get into just stupid, huge numbers. But we really can't grasp it as a, as a number. We're just not that good at it. So I like to do a, a, a sort of a physical real-world comparison. I like to compare mass. So imagine you give a, a single address, whether it be IPv4 or IPv6, the same mass. And you put all of the IPv4 addresses together, and they weigh about 75 milligrams, which, again, is a number that you can't really understand. But if I say that it's three grains of rice, the entire IPv4 address space is three little grains of rice sitting in your hand. If IPv6 addresses had the same mass, they would be that much mass of addresses, which again is another number that doesn't really mean very much by itself. Anyone want to take a guess as to what number that is? What that represents? Yes, it's the mass of the earth. <laughs> so from three grains of rice to the mass of the earth, this is a stupidly huge number of addresses. But technicalities, and I'm surprised nobody's launched up and gone, but that's not how it works, because they're right, it's not how it works. IPv6 actually has a split there are 64 of those bits are for networks, 
and 64 of those bits are for hosts. And it looks a bit like this. So every time you have an IPv6 address, half of these, these numbers here, over here, that's all just telling you what network it's on, routing the packets through the internet to get to a local subnet. The other half are just for addressing machines on a single, what we're in IPv4 we called broadcast domain. Okay, a bunch of machines plugged into a, that's the same VLAN or whatever. And the reaction that I think everybody has, I don't think you can, you can truly understand IPv6 until you've had this reaction. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? We had all these bits and you've gone and squandered half of them on just hosts. Because nobody's going to have, you know, two to the 64, that's four billion times four billion machines on a single network. It doesn't work. It never will work. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the IPv4 internet squared in one subnet. And everybody goes, no, this is, this is terrible. We could have just used, say, 32 bits and left 96 bits for the network and 32 bits. That's still 4 billion machines on a LAN. Or even 65,000, bring it down, only have 16 bits for the host. Yes, they could have done that, but they didn't. And there are a couple of things that are beneficial by just having such a huge space to put all of our hosts into for every single subnet. First off, standardization is great because if you always have the same size of local subnet, you can make assumptions about that and work within it. And there's a number of uh, systems such as stateless auto address configuration, which uh, do the job quite nicely for allowing you to just get a machine on the net. But the big one in the data center, because that's, that's where I live, that's, that's what we're really talking about today, is you never have to worry about sizing your subnets. Okay, if anyone out there who has ever had to design a network with more than one subnet knows this pain. Because you, go, you look at one network and you go, well, it's, oh, it's probably going to have a few machines, so I'll give this a little block, you know, a little 32 address block. This one over here is going to have heaps of machines, so I better give this a really big block, like 512 addresses or 1,024. And then you set that all up and you set up all your routes and everybody's happy and then six months later, that little tiny block is full of machines and you're running around trying to, trying to add more addresses if you can, which is really hard, or, uh, or you're, you're decommissioning machines or putting machines together or thinking about putting a NAT in behind there because you just have to because they're all on that subnet. And this one that had a 1,000 addresses has got like four machines in it. And you're, just, you're wasting addresses here, there and everywhere because you guessed wrong. It's a real pain in the neck. But even more important, this is great, but even more important than that is that you never have to worry about IP address management. In IPv4, you are always, you always have a list of IP addresses. Whether it's your DHCP server maintaining that for you, so a machine can come along and say, please sir, may I have an address? And the, and the DHCP server goes, yeah, okay, you can have that one. But you've got to come back and tell me you're still using it every hour because I might need it for somebody else otherwise. Or alternately, it's the sysadmin doing exactly the same job, but with a little more beard. <laughs> But in either case, you've got someone who is keeping a list of addresses. And if you don't, then you end up with addresses colliding and it's just a great big nightmare and you've got people running around under, under tables, unplugging network cables to try and find out who's got the same address as somebody else. Um, not a lot of fun at all. Um, and, and that huge address space for your host also means that you can do stateless address auto configuration, whereby you just turn up a machine turn, plugs in, you use the MAC address of the machine to get yourself an IP address and you're off to the races. So on the host side, that's, that's the host side of it. Now on the network side, you have two to the 64 networks, which is again a very large number. For every single IP address in the IPv4 internet, you have an IPv4 internet's worth of subnets underneath that. Um, so it is, a, it is a massive number of subnets. Anyone who thinks that we're going to run out of this anytime soon, let's have a chat afterwards. Um, I've, I don't, again, I don't think you can be an IPv6 you know, person until you've sat down on Nanog and written a rant about how this is not enough and the IPv6 designers were terrible. You can go back and find mine some years ago. Um, and it's a periodic argument um, on the, the Nanog list. Um, but yeah, you do get to the point where you realise, look, this is actually a lot of numbers and we can use them all. And by having a lot of networks, it means that we can start routing everything. No more NAT. Okay? I'm not a terrible NAT hater, but I really don't like it if I can avoid it. And you don't have to have them. So you can have routable networks. Everything can talk to everything else. And that brings a lot of real benefits. Yes, up the back. Is that going to make fun for uh, routing tables? Uh, the question was, isn't that going to make it fun for routing tables? Potentially, but you structure your network in such a way that you have routing as per normal. It's, it's really not a problem in practice, and we'll talk about routing in a little while as well. Yes?
Yep, so uh, having a large number of addresses in a large address space, does it make it hard to maintain blacklists? It certainly can, um, but it's not usually a huge problem because if you get abuse from a couple of different machines on the same network, you just blacklist the 64. And the, IP, the IPv6 address space is, is fairly sparse, so you can kind of pick and choose and, and pluck out bits and pieces, usually. But this isn't really an abuse management talk, so I'd prefer not to do that, but I'd love to talk about it with you afterwards. Um, you know, we can, we can trade war stories. So to look at what routable networks for everything means in a, in a you know, uh, real world sort of design, we've got this simple network here. And this looks fairly similar to the kind of thing that, that I run in, uh, in data centers for my day job. In the IPv4 world, what you'll have is uh, your ISP's router up the top there, uh, connected to the internet, will have an IP address on a local network. And then your routers or other edge equipment, whether they be load balancers, NAT gateways, and so forth, um, will have an IP address as well. If you're lucky, your, your ISP will, will graciously allow you to use a slightly larger allocation. Um, you know, you might get a slash 29, which gives you five useful addresses. Um, you, you, will, you will be joyous the day that they give you a larger allocation and suddenly you have like 60 addresses that you can play with and you're like, oh, oh, so much space. I feel like I've moved to Texas. <laughs> um, but you have to use those, those addresses that you have, the few that you get, have to be used for all of those edge, edge boxes. So every load balancer that you want to come in, every, every uh, separate service that you want to provide on a different IP address has to, be, uh, has to have its own IP address and you don't have a lot of them. And you certainly don't have a lot of them. That by the time you, you get to having you know, a larger allocation, you don't have enough of them to be able to address all of your boxes in here directly. So you chuck in some NAT. You have a private range in there. And all of your machines and all of your edge, edge devices all have an IP address from that network. And then because we're talking about containers, you then have sort of little tiny machines running inside of here. And they all need their own addresses. And by default, um, you know, Docker, the predominant containerization system, will use the same range for every single machine you have. So all of those machines, all those containers, will need to be natted by their physical machines onto this network so they can talk to each other and also so that they can get any communication out to the internet. So you have these sort of layers of, of NAT and things that are going on. So, so if you want to have things that talk in here, right through to containers, you have to have everything configured in the middle to sort of have that filter its way down uh, in, into the containers that you're running. In the IPv6 world, we reset ourselves. And now, uh, you'll have a little bit similar in terms of the ISP will normally give you a slash 64, a, a single subnet's worth of addresses, to talk between your router and their router and all your other edge equipment that you have. Uh, you'll typically then have, because you do want to have load balances and so forth, you might have, you'll have, and you'll have some sort of router there because typically your ISP won't give you a whole bunch of switch ports and that sort of thing. Um, and so you'll end up with, with a second network that's routed to you. So your ISP, you'll, you'll have a, a routing address on your router and then um, the ISP will say, well, for any traffic on this, this beef network here, send it through to that, that next hop address. So your routers are then responsible for passing on traffic to all of your internal machines. And then you take other networks, other slash 64 subnets out of that 48 and give them to your network and then all of the machines that you have running containers underneath it. So that means that traffic can go from any container on any machine anywhere else without a hassle, other than your firewalls and so forth. I'm not saying tear down your firewalls and throw them all away, but um, you can allow that traffic to happen without any major uh, contortions and, and tracking and, and management of, of um, all the, the traffic that's going on and the network translations that have to happen. Now, of course, in order for traffic to go from you know, a container running on this little cool network uh, machine over here on the left and say over to there, this, this cough network machine over there, you have to have routes. Edge machine does need to know how to route. They need to know how to route traffic out to the internet. Your, your edge routers need to know how to route traffic back to individual machines so it can be passed onto the containers. And each individual machine needs to be able to route traffic to, other to, to uh, containers and other machines, know which machine to send it to so it can be passed on. Now, there are a lot of dynamic routing protocols out there. The internet runs on one called BGP. There's a few other ones uh, that we use in the IPv4 world, and for the most part, they have IPv6 equivalents. 
but they are fairly complicated. They're an extra daemon to run, they're extra configuration, they're one more thing to break. In simple, straightforward IPv6 networks like these, you don't need any of them. Just use these things called router advertisements. Now, of course, okay, you may not have heard of that unless you're an IPv6 weenie like me. So, the DAO of router advertisements, really quickly, the most common use case for them and the way that they sort of, you know, usually come across is that they will uh, allow a machine that just connects to the network without any DHCP configuration or anything to find the default gateway to get out to the internet or to get out to all other networks. And you can have multiple machines on a network saying I am the default router and so you can have high availability, um, you know, uh, redundant networking for your internet which is really cool. But they're not just for default gateways. You can actually say, if you need to route to this specific subnet of any length, come talk to me. And the nice thing is, is that they're not some add-on feature that you have to have. They're fundamental. They're a core building block of IPv6. So that means that everything supports it. If you've got something that can talk IPv6, then it can receive and process router advertisements. If you've got something that can route IPv6, then it advertises. It's capable of sending router advertisements. So the RADVD daemon in Linux does all of this perfectly. It's what we use at work. Works like a charm. Never have a hassle with it. So every time you start up a new machine, it boots up. It says, hey, what have I got in the way of routes? And everyone else goes, oh, they're over here. And then that machine says, well, I have this route over here. And everybody else dutifully updates their routing tables. And periodically, everyone you know, sends a little multicast packet around and says, yeah, I'm still here. Still got this route. And everyone goes, fantastic. I'll keep that in mind. So it just flows. Now, I was talking before about needing routing so that you can get you know, talking, containers talking to each other directly without needing to go through layers of port forwarding and so forth. Um, and this is really, really handy. It's so handy, in fact. Um, that, that people have built all sorts of, of crazy systems for doing this um, in IPv4. It's called overlay networking. Systems like Flannel and, and WeaveNet and things, they all exist to allow direct communication between machines. And there's some real advantages to it. Like, it's a, it's a great idea. Um, it gives you things like not having to worry about configuring port forwarding. Uh, you don't have to worry about keeping track of which port is associated with which service. Now, if you're lucky, your service discovery mechanism will do this for you. And if you're going to talk on Tuesday, you've got a bit of an idea about how you can do that. But there are service discovery mechanisms out there that are in very wide use that don't track ports. So early on in my tenure at my current job, um, we had a text file and it had a port number and a customer name. And every time you move, you know, we had people moving around, um, we'd, we'd make sure that we had the same port on the new machine. We didn't want to have collisions happening. And then you'd have someone who'd forget to update the, the text file, and then someone else would come along and take the same number, and, you know, confusion resulted. So pretty quickly, that was out the door. No, sorry, not doing that anymore. Um, there's also less moving parts, because you don't have an overlay network running in your system. So you don't have an extra daemon. You don't have to worry about etcd shitting itself and, and scattering routing all over the place, or taking your entire network down, or whatever other crazy failure mode you've got. And you've got one less thing to have to trace your packets through when you're, when you're trying to hunt things down. And finally, because you're using standard components, you don't have to worry about when you go to your next job, or your next customer, or your next whatever, you don't have to worry that they're using something else. You know, you, you are, you know I'm using Overlay over here, and my last job was using WeaveNet, and then this, this new customer I've taken on now, oh God, it's got some crazy lashed up thing that some bearded, weirdy Unix guy named Matt built and then left. <laughs> you don't have that sort of problem because everyone's just using the same technologies because that's the standard, that's the way that it's done. Now, I talked earlier, uh, in addition to container-container communication, I did mention that, that containers can talk to the internet and also that means that, contain that the internet can potentially talk to your containers. Now, for many of you, this is, this is the reaction you're having at the moment internally, okay? The idea that, that, that anyone would ever be allowed to send traffic into your network beyond your, your edge devices is just terrifying, absolutely like white knuckle, oh my God, that would be the end of the world. The, what you've built, the reason why you're having this reaction is because you've built what's called, what uh, Tom Arnold referred to as eggshell security, okay? Tough, crispy exterior, soft and gooey on the inside. Some people call it M&M security, uh, you know, or any other candy that's, that fits that description. Um, and the thing is, this is not an IPv6 specific problem. 
Okay, this is, this is something that everybody builds um, and it's really easy. The problem with eggshell security, of course, is that when it breaks, you have a real big mess. And the problem is that it's going to break because sooner or later, some attacker is going to find some little tiny pinhole in your security, something that didn't quite get patched up and you're going to be wrecked. If you're lucky, they'll just steal all your customer data and stick it on pastebin. That's just a PR nightmare. Alternately, they may get in, wipe all your systems and your backups, and your company's dead. And the reason we build these systems is because when we have that crunchy exterior where we, we know that nobody is ever going to get into the network because it's just not allowed, then when you set up a, a reader server or a Mongo server one afternoon, you're just like, oh, I couldn't be bothered setting a password on it and then configuring it. I'll do it next week. And then next week, the next fire comes along and your boss is on your back going, come on, we need to set this other thing up. And so your, your systems will naturally, you'll, you'll be automatically programmed to build systems that don't have any sort of security or isolation um, on them because you don't need to. You know in the back of your mind or even in the front of your mind, there's been plenty of security reviews I've been in where someone said, oh, it's all right, the, the load balancer means that no traffic will get in other than the stuff that we want. Yeah, I hear a scoff, yeah. I think you've been in the same meetings as me. Um, and you, yeah, and it's just, it's so easy to argue, well, we can just leave it alone because the firewall will take care of it. So if you're building those networks, yes, you can't just let IPVCs come into your network and let people talk, but you're already screwed. So fix that and then go back and, and reconsider using modern technologies. If you haven't read uh, the, the Beyond Corp papers, this concept from Google of, you know, don't, don't trust anything just because of its location on the network. Trust a device because it proves that it is trustworthy, that it is, that it is the right thing to be talking to. If you haven't read these papers, go read them. They're a fantastic uh, shift in your, in your security mindset overall. Uh, very highly recommended. Now, you might think, but hang on a second, why do I care about um, having things talk to my internal network. Why, don't, I have my load balancers, don't I? Well, yes, you do, but if you're able to send traffic, if you want to, to random containers in your network, you get flexibility. It means that if you want to deploy a new protocol or a new service to your environment, you don't have to worry about whether or not your load balancers can cope with it because you can route that to elsewhere in your network, to something that can handle that traffic directly. I'm not talking about HTTP. If you're running a HTTP service, sure, stick it through a load balancer. They're fantastic. Um, but if, if you want to go beyond just HTTP, then you might have to consider not having one tier of load balancers that just take everything and then have it all just distribute out from there. So hopefully by now in the talk, I've convinced you that IPv6 and containers are at least, if not awesome, with you know, shiny, sparkly, psychedelic pictures, but at least not a bad idea. Something worth looking into, perhaps. And I thought that too. For like two years, I ran a network using exactly these concepts. And apart from some little hassles that I'll talk about later, it worked really well. The network worked fantastically. We were able to simplify so much about our, about our setup and our deployment and our maintenance and configuration that it was a breeze. I was still the only sysadmin two years later, but we'd added like 12 devs because this system was so much easier to run than what we had before. And I wasn't firefighting anymore, it felt a lot better. Then, one day, dark clouds appeared on the horizon. What happened was we had a customer who came to us, a potential customer who came to us, and they needed to run um, systems in multiple different geographic locations, places where it wasn't necessarily all that easy to get a rack and stuff some hardware in. And also, they had drunk the, the cloud Kool-Aid and we weren't going to get the job unless we put it on, a, on a, one of the big three cloud providers. So um, I'm just going to have a, a review of, of the three big cloud providers and their stance on IPv6. So, oh, come on, don't spoil the fun. Oh, you've ruined the okay. Anyway, so this is, our, this is our IPv6 network from before. You know, remember, we have our, our provider gives us a slash 48, which we allocate to all the machines and, and everything's happy. So let's talk about AWS. With AWS, you get a VPC, okay, a virtually private cloud. So it's not really private, it's just virtually private. Um, and if you tick the little box when you create your VPC to say, yes, I would like the new IPv6 hotness, they will give you a slash 56 network, which is 256 subnets, reasonable number, not as good as our slash 48, which is 65,000, but let's see what we can do with it. So the next thing you do after you create a VPC is you create a bunch of subnets. 
That's what these little, little lock boxes are. And the dotted lines around them are availability zones, because if you don't put things in multiple availability zones, it's going to catch fire, and then AWS will point and laugh at you. So you create subnets. And when you create a subnet in an IPv6-enabled um, VPC, you can get a slash 64 assigned to that subnet. So far, this is looking good. This is just like we had before, wasn't it? Every subnet we created had a slash 64 for all the machines to talk to each other on. What have I typed? 42, but then you've given it 4204. Should have been. Uh, no, I haven't. It should have been 4200 no. at the top, not 0042. True. Yeah. Okay. Right. On. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't do IPv6 very well. Um, so anyway, you get your you get your um, your network here, and uh, each of your subnets has a slash 64. So all of your instances and all of your databases and everything that, that connects into that subnet has an IP address out of that block. But the problem is you can't route additional subnets to your EC2 instances. So this thing we had before of, well, every machine that runs containers gets a slash 64, and then we can set up the routing to it, and then the containers can talk to each other and everything's happy, doesn't work. Just doesn't work. Now, I, now this is not the end of the world, because uh, Amazon allows you to attach multiple IP addresses uh, to a network interface. The problem is they don't allow you to attach very many. So there's a couple of types here that say IPv6 not supported. And uh, I saw that and, and you know, uh, had a little bit of a, oh my god. But it turns out those are all old instance types, and I doubt you'd be running them for a containerization system. Um, but then you have all your other types here, 10s and 15s. 30 is the maximum you can get per interface on any EC2 instance, as far as I'm aware. Certainly the only ones I could find in the chart. And this means that. Um, if you run a lot of containers, which you should, because that's what containers are all about, you know, put little workloads into a container, put lots of little containers everywhere, everyone's happy, it means you can only run, even on the largest EC2 instance, about 30 containers before you run out of addresses. On your smaller types that you might, be willing, you might prefer to use until you get to massive scale, you get 10 or 15. That's a problem because uh, I've got like half a dozen containers that just do service discovery and configuration management and monitoring and all that sort of stuff. Just basic stuff that happens on every single machine. So on smallish instances, I've got four containers that I can run my app out of. Even on the really, so you go, oh, well, I need more addresses, so I'll get bigger instances. But even these ones down here, we're talking machines with 64 gig of RAM. I'm going to want to run a heck of a lot more than 24 containers in 64 gig of RAM. Thank you very much. So you're going, well, that just, it's not possible. Well, there's a wrinkle here, and this is kind of the, the, the sidestep you can do a little bit with AWS. Because this heading up the top here says IPv6 addresses per interface, not per EC2 instance. So you can attach multiple interfaces to a single EC2 instance and allocate addresses across all of them. Um, this does actually kind of sort of work, because in Docker you can tell it, for instance, um, when it wants an IP address, it can run custom plugins or whatever. So it can go out to EC2 and find an interface that has a spare address slot available and all that sort of thing. Except in the, the documentation for this, it says you shouldn't put more than one interface, for instance, onto one subnet. Because otherwise you get weird things like asymmetric routing. Now, I, have, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have enough trouble getting AWS to do the things that the documentation says I can do. <laughs> I'm not about to start doing the things that AWS says, AWS says I shouldn't do. So, yeah, that's uh, not great. So what do you do next? Well, I guess the other option is you can have lots of subnets and attach an interface to each of those subnets and then play crazy routing games. And it will maybe eventually sort of work if you're really lucky. Um, but to be frank, we didn't dare. At this point, this is, this is where you know, the, the guy comes through the thing saying, here's AWS. Um, we gave up. We don't, run, we, don't, we don't run and don't plan on running IPv6 in our AWS deployments. And as somebody who, who has been a long time lover of IPv6 and who runs IPv6 very happily in internal deployments, not being able to do this was heartbreaking because all of our stuff was set up for IPv6. Our internal service discovery system that, we, that we'd built only recorded IPv6 addresses. It didn't have the capacity to handle an IPv4 address. So uh, yeah, to have to sort of stand back and go, well, no, actually, the, the prudent engineering decision here is we're just going to do IPv4 in AWS was, was a bit heartbreaking. But all was not necessarily lost, because there are two other cloud providers. 
And as soon as we started talking about this, uh, a colleague of mine who has got a lot of experience with Azure said, oh, Matt, it's all right. We don't have to worry because Azure has IPv6. And he pointed me at this, this article from a bit over a year ago. And I was like, oh, this is good. I like this idea. Um, so I'll go and read into this, this article. And it got to about the third paragraph, and, and I hit this little gem. And so you can receive native IPv6 traffic, provided that caveats, hmm, caveats. So you've got to have a network address configured to request private IPv6 addresses. OK, well, hang on, no, wait, private? Private IPv6 addresses? Oh, hang on, that sounds a little bit like NAT, doesn't it? Um, no, I think it's private, like ULA. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, ULA stuff. Um, so yeah, so, so private addresses in IPv6, there is a block similar to the RFC 1918 concept, um, whereby there's a big block of addresses that you can use if you need to have private addresses. Um, they call it unique, uh, unique local addresses rather than uh, you know, globally unique addresses, which is what you normally have. Sorry? I don't think it means link local addresses. Um, yeah, you can't request a link local address, you just turn one on. So I think that's what this is. So I never, I never did this. This whole thing, I was just like, you know what? This sounds like way too much work. I'm never going to bother trying. Because when they start talking about you know, having members of a load balance set that has an IPv6 address, well, OK, you're going to be natting that stuff out, presumably. Um, and if they think that IPv6 NAT is the winning solution, then I'm pretty sure they're not going to give me a big chunk of, of IPv6 subnets that I can route to my instances and have all the routing work behind the scenes. Um, yeah, so one, actually one thing about that, the, the routing stuff, I said that um, you know, we use RAVD in, in our deployments and use router advertisements. And router advertisements only work if you have a multicast network, because IPv6 is all about multicast. Um, but all these cloud providers don't provide you with an Ethernet network. There's no layer two that actually works. Um, there's, there's some great uh, uh, talks from uh, AWS people from the reInvent conference about how VPC networking actually works. And it's cool. It's like look up tables and caches and packets whizzing everywhere. And it's, it's, it's really interesting stuff if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but it does mean that you don't get any of the stuff that's below IP just does not work. So uh, yeah, that's, you, you kind of you end up limited there. And anyway, if they're not going to give you the address space for you to give to your machines that will be routed out to the internet and back and forth, well, you're back at a NAT land anyway. And the thing about IPv6 features is that, yeah, they work for the most part, but there's more edge cases that people haven't hit because there's not as much deployment. So if you're going to go doing things like NAT, then you may as well just stick with IPv4. You're not gaining anything by using IPv6. And I'm very pragmatic. As much as I like the new shiny technology as much as anyone, Anyone in this room, probably. Um, I'm not willing to risk the stability of my infrastructure for start if it doesn't give me any benefit. And so as soon as they started talking about IPv6 NAT and private addresses and other sort of stuff, I went, no, write it off. It's just not worth the risk. So then we're like, well, OK, one's all right, one's a write off. But the one that is Google, they're, like, they're not some stodgy 1990s desktop OS computing company. They're, they're of the future. They're of the internet. Surely they've got a better story for this. So that was back in October 30, Sorry, yeah, back in October 2016. That was when it was written, um, that, that Azure article. And this is like now, and it's still not working. So, yeah, so Google, though, this is what they have about IPv6. It's even worse than Azure. Google is a major advocate of IPv6, and it is an important future direction. Now, I don't speak PR. Is, is anybody here like a you know, hardcore PR person can translate that? The not here. No. So, yeah, so, so I, but I, I, you know, there, are, there are translation engines on the internet. Um, and so I plugged this in and selected PR as the language, and I, I picked uh, geek as the output language, and it gave me this. <laughs> yeah, in, in slightly less crude terms, uh, it's basically, Google loves themselves some IPv6, but you smelly pee on sysadmins are not getting it. Not getting your hands on it. So that was really saddening. I was, like, I was heartbroken. I, I really thought that Google would be the solution to all of our problems for this. Um, but obviously, you know, for whatever reason, whatever they've built internally is not going to support IPv6 in a sane manner anytime soon. So OK, then we went back to AWS. We slapped down the corporate credit card and said, give us some stuff. Pardon? Tell Dave. 
Okay, right. Uh, some sort of in joke going on there in the audience. I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, so it was really, really quite depressing in the end. And I also did. I went out and, and rummaged around and looked at a lot of the other cloud providers, little ones out there. Um, and and uh, you know, I found that for, on the whole, the story was just was equally as bad. It was just not good. Um, and then my boss came back to me and said, Matt, nobody got fired for buying AWS. I was like, right, okay. <laughs> right, I know, I know what's going on there. Right, back, back we go, back to AWS. Yeah, corporate credit card. Everyone's happy. Now, if it was just the cloud providers that were a problem, um, that would be heartbreaking for most people because, let's face it, most of us have some sort of workload in the cloud. Um, but it goes deeper than that. It's not just the cloud providers that are going to cause you problems if you're going to run IPv6 in containers. There's this doom-laden <laughs> rude words. <laughs> um, so, so Docker, they have, they have decent uh, story about IPv6 support. You can you know, give it a, a local address range and, and it'll allocate addresses out of that. Um, by default, it allocates addresses sequentially uh, because that's how it does it in IPv4. So why not? And the problem with that is exactly the same problem as it is if you're allocating uh, addresses in IPv4 sequentially. You can have a machine, you can have a container turn up, get an address, provide a service, advertise itself, everybody's happy. Then that container goes away and another container starts up for a different service that happens to be listening on the same port. And so your service discovery mechanism, which is always asynchronous, there's a period of time in which the old service advertisement is still drifting around in your network somewhere. And, um, and so uh, clients will try and connect to that service, thinking to, to that address on that port, thinking it's the old service when it's actually the new one. This can confuse customers if it's a, if it's a web application uh, and you happen to be you know, reusing ports because you'll get a different website than you're expecting. Okay, that's not great. What about if it's a Redis server though? Because of course nobody runs Redis with passwords, right? Yeah? Nobody, nobody in recorded history has ever used that feature of Redis. And so you get a web application talking to a Redis server that's for a different web application. And worse, because uh, Redis connections are normally long lived, that can be doing that for hours, days, weeks, if you have a relatively stable environment. So uh, the short answer to that, of course, is that you do run passwords on your Redis server and you set them to just the name of the customer or something. And that way, if you connect and you're expecting one customer, but you actually get another, then the password fails and you go and try and connect to another one. Um, yeah, just a little pro tip there if you're running Redis in, in containers like IPv4. So in IPv6, what you do is um, you allocate a, a pseudo-random uh, IPv6 address. Uh, we cheated and just put, made the MAC address of the container um, the MD5 sum of like the container's name and the host name. So you get stable addresses, um, which is good. And, but you don't get this, this sequential problem coming up. And we can do this because we have such a huge address space in IPv6. If you wanted to do this um, uh, and, and do it over and over again, you could do I haven't done the, the calculations lately, but it's, you can do it for thousands of years, running a thousand containers a second, and you'll statistically never get a collision in your addresses. So you just, yeah, just run MD5 over it, it's fine. It's random enough for our purposes. So it's not, it's not fantastic, um, the, the Docker support for IPv6, but it's there and it works. Or does it? Oh, no. This ripper of a bug, yeah, a bit over a month old, um, this ripper of a bug took us down for quite some time, all of our customers. What happened was, um, if you restart Docker, so if you restart Docker normally, all of your containers get restarted. They get shut down, they get brought back up again. No worries. But sometimes you have containers that you don't want to necessarily have die on you every time you need to reconfigure Docker to do anything, because of course Docker likes itself some configuration flags on the command line or whatever. Um, so you have to restart it. And you don't want things to be going away all the time. So, and you don't need to have them go away. The containers work just fine, because Docker has this cool live restore flag now. Uh, got added quite a while ago now, and it, it works. You know, you, there's, a, there's a process, a little shim process that, that stays running and connects to the container, and then Docker goes away and comes back and talks to the socket, and everybody's happy. But if you stop Docker, or just restart it, you know, you stop it, everything's fine. Everything just keeps on humming along nicely. Start Docker back up again, and all your networking is just gone. 
All your IPv6 networking just disappears. And that's because when Docker starts up, it decides, you know what I'm going to do? All these containers, they don't need IPv6 addresses. And then it just goes along and it connects to each container and takes away all of your IPv6 configuration. Doesn't change the IP address or anything like that, it just removes it. Removes all of your, your, uh, your configured addresses, all of your link local addresses, your loopback address, it's all just gone. You can imagine how confusing this was to diagnose live when everything's, you know, all the alerts are going off. Oh my God, so we're all in there. What's going on? And finally someone says, there's no addresses in these containers. Wah! Of course, Docker still thinks there's addresses on the outside. If you do a Docker inspect, it says, yes, you have this IP address. It's only when you actually connect to the container and run, you know, IP add sh or whatever, and it shows there's no addresses there. Oh, okay. So I reproed it in, you know, once we knew what it was, I reproed it in no time, reported this bug, took over a month to be fixed. And the really stupid thing about this is, this, we weren't running up-to-date Docker at the time. We only run the stable releases, and for various reasons, we hadn't upgraded um, most of our stuff from 1706 at the time. Naughty us. Um, so, so this happened in December. I think this was either the same day or the day after I, I reported this bug. So this was sitting latent for like five months. Nobody else had hit this on the entire internet as far as we could find. So are we the only people on Earth that are running IPv6 and live restore in Docker? Kind of must be. It's, it's the only thing I can imagine. Now, we'd had plenty of machines over the time that had been restarted, you know, shut down and started back up again. That doesn't trigger the bug. It's only when you restart Docker on a running system that it triggers. We don't do that very often, but when we do, all hell breaks loose. So you didn't turn it off and on again. That was the problem. Yeah, so I didn't turn it off and on again. That, was, that is exactly the problem. Oh, okay. Yes. But of course, if you're going to restart your machines, you might as well just not run live restore, and then you end up with the same behavior. So. Yeah, um, so yeah, it took them months to fix this, as I said, which means it didn't get into the 17.12 release either, which means that it's going to be March before we get our next stable uh, uh, channel release that's going to have this bug fix in it. So we have all sorts of like locks and padlocks and all sorts of things on, on any attempt to restart Docker now. It's like, are you sure? Are you really sure? Are you willing to incur the wrath of the Womble? Um, <laughs> and so on and so forth through several sequences before it will actually let you uh, restart Docker. And of course, Docker these days is, is all passe. We're all, pff, nah, we don't do that anymore. These days, it's up for uh, well, that one, yeah. It's a very boring logo. Docker, you know, like, yes, I know what that is. That's Docker. These guys here, I don't know, it's Kubernetes. Oh. Yeah, Kubernetes. Yeah, we've got someone here who doesn't know what it is because it's such a nondescript logo. It could be anything. Logo? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah, nobody looks at the logo. They just look at the K8S. Anyway, so Kubernetes. Um, we don't run Kubernetes uh, at our work because we've been using containers for so long that none of this sort of technology has existed. So we sort of lashed together something half assed that did what we wanted. We're an infrastructure company. We're trying to build a web application. So we lashed up just enough to make it work. And there's no way in hell anyone else would ever want to touch it. So uh, we haven't got Kubernetes because every time we look at Kubernetes, we're like, yeah, it's, it's cute and it would solve some problems. But geez, it'd be a lot of work to migrate. So no, we won't do that for now. Um, I've found some blog posts, though, from people who, who say, yes, I'm running Kubernetes in an, in an IPv6-only network. But in order to do it, um, I had to lash up these things here and bolt on this bit over here. But it works as long as I put these three configuration lines into every pod that I run. Which means that you can't use anyone else's pod definitions without forking them and then doing your own thing. So to me, I mean, it's nice that it works as much as it does. I will give them credit for the fact that it works at all. Um, but I would not recommend running Kubernetes in an, in an IPv6 dominant mode, which is annoying because Kubernetes needs direct communication between all of its pods. It's what it does, like it's, it's how it works, which means that IPv6 would be perfect for this. That's exactly what IPv6 gives you with a lot less stuffing around and a lot less extra bits and pieces um, than, than you would have to worry about with an IPv4 network. Um, so yeah, to me, honestly, in summary, you know, to sort of wrap all this up, IPv6, in theory, is great for containers. It's a nice match of, of technology capability with technology requirements. Um, in practice, though, the big cloud providers are not going to make it easy for you. Some of them will make it impossible. Some of them will just make it a real big pain in the butt. And finally, even if you wrestle yourself out of that one, the container ecosystem support for IPv6 is risky, and I would not trust it unless you are looking for a bit of an adventure um, or you really, really, really enjoy writing big, long, detailed bug reports. So on that sombre and heartening note, I will thank you very much for listening through my rant and uh, enjoy the rest of your conference.
Thank you, Matt. That was wonderful. Thanks, Dave. Everyone was awesome. It's present. Yes, and if you'd like to argue the finer points of stateless address auto configuration and IP subnet sizes, come on down. <laughs> <laughs>